Hmm. Just let go and let God. Just let go and let God. You've all heard that saying before, right? You might hear that when we have some anxieties kicking in. Or when we're trying to deal with something and somebody might say to you, just let go and let God. That's actually a heresy called quietivism. It's this idea that you don't have to do anything. Just let go and let God. See, God works in us. A lot of us use that idea and we'll use that to say, to save us from confrontation. To save us like it gives us some kind of a, a, a reassurance of our faith. That if we just let go and let God, he'll do it all. And then some of us take that to a point of saying, well, if God's, God's will be done no matter what. So what am I to do about it? Just let go and let God as if we have no responsibility then we'll say God's will for my life will be done whether I strive to do it or whether I don't. It, it will be done. We know it's God. He, he will complete all things. But then on the other end of the spectrum is this, this other uh, false idea of perfectionism that will say that if you're not doing all these things, then you must not be saved. If, you, if you're going to be a Christian, you have to come to church eight days a week, right? You have to read your Bible for ten hours a day. You have to pray for four hours a day. You have to do all these things. If you don't come to the church on a Sabbath, then you know you surely aren't a Christian. Because if you don't come to church on a Sabbath, then you're not uh, abiding by God's rules. Now, I would say you have a misunderstanding of Scripture if you're not celebrating the Sabbath. But that doesn't mean you're not a Christian. But some will elevate this to such a point where they'll say, you've got to do everything perfect. And if you, if you step out of line a little bit, if you're not righteous, then you're not saved. That's, that's false too. See, our goal today is to, to be encouraged and to strive for sanctification. We want to strive to be holy. We want to strive to working towards being sanctified, being holy. See, we have a restless, sovereign God that He doesn't stop. He continuously works. And we are to continuously work. Not work to gain our salvation, but work to show that we have it. And this is what we're going to see in our text today in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. We're going to see that the, the whole reason the Philippians strove for their sanctification was to show their Christ-likeness with reverence as they worked out in their lives what God was working in them for His pleasure. And this is the point that we must strive for. See, we must strive for sanctification by working out what God is working in. Because if we don't we're not following God's will for our life. We must strive for sanctification by working out what God is working in. So if you look with me at Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Hear now the word of the living God. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. As far as the reading of the word of God, amen. See, brothers and sisters, we must strive for sanctification. We must strive for it by working out what God is working in us. Look at the, the end part of verse 12. It says, quite clearly, work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Well, this text gives a whole bunch of people a whole bunch of problems. Because it just says right, right off the back, if you just 
critique it within its own context. Well, you got to work out your own salvation. Well, I thought salvation was a gift from God. How can you work out your own salvation? And this has caused people some problems all throughout history. You know, you're working for salvation. You've got to work for it. But did you notice it doesn't say to work for your salvation. It says work out your own salvation. This is something that you've already had. It's, it's, a, it's progressively coming to experience all the aspects and all the blessings of salvation. That's what this is speaking of. Or you could say it is a progressive act that God is working in you. It's not working for your salvation. We know that salvation is a free gift of God, right? Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you've been saved, not by works. Right? So if it's, if, if, if it's of works, then it's not of grace. Paul's not speaking about working for your salvation. I mean, it's quite clear, just looking at the very next verse. It says, for it is God who works in you. See, salvation is an act of God alone. But sanctification is an act of God and man. See, one of the problems is, is we see these words salvation, and we automatically think, well, it just means saving faith. But that's not the case. Salvation is used in many different aspects throughout the Bible. And in this case here, it simply means progressive sanctification. It, sanctification is, is, is a simple way of saying being, becoming holy. So the doctrine of sanctification can be clearly laid out by saying it's an act of God and man. So it's what's called synergistic. Uh, that, if, if you don't know what that means, you hear the end of that, that word gistic, you hear the gist of things, right? So synergistic, the, the gist of things would be the, the point of action. Synergistic would be uh, like synchronized, coming alongside of more than one, two persons, like we sync our watches, right? So synergistic would be two people working towards something. So sanctification is an act of God and man, where we sin less and less and become more like God. We sin less and less and become more Christ-like. And that's what Paul is talking about here. He's talking about becoming sanctified, becoming holy. But this, this, this isn't done instantly. Sure, there's a part of sanctification that when God regenerates you, when he takes your heart of stone out and puts in a heart of flesh, that there is a sense that you do definitively become sanctified because God makes you pure in such a way that you are able to repent of your sins. You have fit to believe the gospel, but becoming sanctified, following through that, is an active process that goes on and on and on for the totality of the Christian life. It's never perfected in this life. And Paul says that quite clearly just in one page over in Philippians chapter 3 verses 12 and 13. He says, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on. See, that's what sanctification is. It, it's striving to press on, striving to be more and more like Christ, striving to mortify your sin, to, to do away with your sin. So, sanctification is synergistic. Salvation itself is monogistic. Again, that word gistic, the gist of things, the point of things. Mono means simply one. Right? We, we have one God. We believe in one God. And salvation is from that one God. So it's mono meaning one, gistic. One act of God that brings you to salvation. But yet our sanctification, as we strive for sanctification, it is God working in you and your will. So you see, brothers and sisters, when you say, just let go and let God, you do away with any responsibility on your part. And you say, God can do it all. See, we are to strive for our sanctification. We are to strive to work, to finish the race. 
And Paul says this, uses the metaphor of a, a runner running on a constant basis. Actually, in Acts 20, Paul uses a great scenario and a great application in Acts 20, verses 24. He says, but I do not account my life of anything value nor precious to myself. If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus Christ. To testify to the gospel of the grace. See, uh, we are to strive for sanctification. We are to run this race. And so Paul, on a constant basis, is giving us this illustration. That we are to run, run, run. You're running a race. And sometimes these races are hard for us to deal with. You have stuff that comes up in your life. How do you deal with it? Run. Strive for sanctification. Strive to be more and more holy. That's what our goal is. See, we must strive for sanctification by working out what God is working in us. See, God is working things in your life that His will be done, as it says in verse 13, that both His will and His work will be done in you. But you must strive for sanctification by working out what God is working in you. Brothers and sisters, friends, if God isn't working in you, he may not be with you. If, if, if you're not reflecting on yourself and striving to be more and more like Christ, and less and less like yourself, there's a good chance God isn't with you. And you can't strive for sanctification at that point because you don't even have salvation. We need to examine ourselves to see if you're in the faith. Are you, are you living your life in faith, but it's blind faith? Are you living your life in such a way that, well, I come to church for all these years. And I, I know I'm saved. Oh, sure, I'm, I have real no desire to be, you know, more holier. You should be searching your heart. Striving to mortify your sin. Examining your heart. Am I striving to sin less? Am I looking at the situations that I'm in and saying, is this sin? If it is, I need to do away with it. Maybe you have a, a dirty sin that you just are afraid to let, let loose to people. Let out. I'll tell you, one of the one of the greatest things that you can have, not only as a pastor, but as a Christian, is an accountability partner. Some, some of you, it may be your husbands and wives, but I suggest you have somebody outside of your husband and wife. Do life together in such a way that you can trust each other with no matter what is going on with your life. If you have a dirty sin that you can have somebody in your congregation, another brother or sister in Christ that you can confide in, that can hold you accountable, that won't go off blabbing it to everybody, but will help to keep you accountable to your sin, that you will continuously strive to mortify the flesh so that you can be more and more like Christ. See, many of us have heard messages from people that have a big smiling face, that don't want to talk about sin. And we don't want to hear messages about sin. Because that's just depressing. But do you know what the work of the Holy Spirit is? To convict people of their sin. So if you're not being convicted of your sin. That means the Holy Spirit isn't working in you. And at that. I would plead with you. Repent. Repent. Ask the Lord to come give you life. Seek his face. Seek his guidance. We need to examine ourselves. See, we must strive for sanctification. Strive for sanctification, brothers and sisters. Because we must strive for it by working out what God is working in us. The things that's going on in our lives, we've got to strive to work. To be more like Christ. So what have we what have we learned that's blatantly clear, right? 
We must strive for sanctification by working out what God is working in us. But how, how do we know what God's working in us? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because that's the very next thing in my notes. We, we know what God is working in us when we strive for sanctification by obeying Christ. See, look, look with me at verses tw- the, the second part of verse 12. He says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my present, but much more in my absence. He says, now that you have always obeyed. See, this, re- this word therefore... It's, it, it's really the, the whole reason for Paul's exhortation. He's, he's saying, that, therefore, everything that we already talked about, everything we talked about last week and the previous week, that, that Jesus is fully God and fully man, that manifested in the flesh. He come to earth, lived the life that you couldn't live, died the death that you deserved, and three days later was resurrected. And, and we learned all about that. He was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, right? So, therefore, you do likewise. That's what Paul's saying here. It's the, the whole reason. He's drawing an inference, or he's drawing a conclusion off of Christ's obedience, and saying, you, therefore, obey. And look at the encouragement that Paul puts here. He says that, that, that you, as you have always obeyed. So, this is the pastor of this church. He's saying, as you have always obeyed. I know that you're obeying. You do likewise. Obey Christ. See, Paul loves his congregation. And he wants them to strive for sanctification. And he's, Paul's really doing the same. He's recapitulating what he said in chapter 1 verse 27. When he said that, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. So that rather I come and see you or I am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, in one faith, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Obey Christ. As Christ left his throne in heaven, he, he was in the form of God. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. You do likewise. Serve people. Serve the, what God has given you to do. What has Christ given us to do? Well, Christ gave us the great command, the great commission. He said to, to go therefore. He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Right? So he said to go, do these things. See, if, if we're striving for sanctification, we will be striving to be obedient to Christ. We'll strive to, be, to obey Christ. Think about, think about a person that just comes to faith. A person who sees the glory of God for the first time. They just they want to run and share the gospel with everybody. When you guys first recognized that you were saved, that God transferred you from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of His beloved Son, when you first recognized that, do you remember the joy? When you first come to realize that you're a Christian destined for hell. That God's wrath was going to come upon you. But yet, He sought you so much and He loved you to such a point that He saved you. That He, he, he bore the wrath for your sins And when you recognized that. Do you remember that time? Did you have a, a joy in your heart? I have to share this message to everybody. Think about the, 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 the Samaritan woman. You guys remember the story in the Samaritan woman in John 4? Jesus walks through to the town of Samaria. And a woman who has been in her sin so much, ashamed so much to the point where she couldn't even go and draw water for her husband during the early morning. Had to go in the, in the heat of the day. Couldn't be seen with normal people. She had so much sin. I mean, later on in the story, Jesus says to her, what, go and tell your husband to, to come and she he, she sa- and he says, oh, you don't have one husband, but you have five? You remember that story? She, so Jesus says to her, give me a drink of water. And he says something down the lines of, how are you a Jew speaking to me, a Samaritan, telling me to give you water? What did Jesus say? 
If you knew who it was that was speaking to you, you wouldn't ask how I'd to give you water. I, that I, would, I would give you living water. And it's water that you would always have. It's a, a, a water that would, would be a spring welling up inside of you. See, when we strive for sanctification, when we are striving to be obedient to Christ, when we see what God has done in us, and it will progressively be working through us to where we want to share that truth with others. And we're being obedient to Christ when we do that. Look at this Samaritan woman at the end. What did she do? She, she come to get water, right? What did she do? She left her pail in her bucket. She went running. i got to tell everybody this. Come and see the person that told me all that I ever knew and did. So here was a, a woman that couldn't be in the presence of anybody because of her sin and her shame. And she goes straight into it being obedient to Christ because he spoke into her that she recognized the truth of who he was and it stirred and put well up inside of her a spring of water that would lead to eternal life. See, we must strive for sanctification, brothers and sisters. If you are... Being obedient to Christ, you will strive to fulfill the Great Commission. Think about the first part of the book. We talked about standing united in gospel-centered fellowship for several, several sermons. If you're being obedient to Christ, you will do just that. You will strive to... To have gospel-centered fellowship. You will strive to, for your sanctification by being obedient to the command that God has given us. Even with this wonderful idea that I hear coming to, that everybody's coming to do crafts. Oh, that, that, as a pastor, that makes me, that brings joy to my heart that seeing that you guys are getting together. But let's take that another step forward. Let's reach out to the community. Let's put signs up all over the community. Come and do some crafts with us. Let's do some things to draw people into us. Preach the word. Go to your neighbors. We need to reach that town. I mean, it's just right there. Y'all live in it. Reach it. Use everybody that lives in there. Let them be, that you be a beacon of light to that. If Jesus would decide to shut these doors of this church, our goal should be to be so obedient to Christ that the unbelievers down there would be begging us to not leave. That they would be saying, come back church, come back, we need you. That should be our goal. And if we're doing that, we can know that we are striving for sanctification, that we're striving to obey Christ, because that's the orders that he gave us. To go make disciples. What kind of ministries are you involved with? What kind of things are you doing for the kingdom? See, we must strive for sanctification. By striving to, be, to obey Christ. Strive for sanctification, brothers and sisters. I know some of you might say, well... Isn't that your job, pastor, to create ministry? Aren't you to get ministry moving? Isn't that your job? Well, yeah. And no. It's not just my job. My, my job is to equip the saints to do the work of ministry. It's not to do all the ministry. See, we must strive for sanctification. And we do this when we strive for sanctification by striving to follow the shepherds that Christ has put over you. Look, in, look at verse the, the, the last half of verse 12. Paul says, So now, or the middle half of verse 12, I'm sorry. Paul says, So now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So think about this. How, how often have we heard people say, I'm not going to go to church. I don't want to be around all them hypocrites. Well, what's Paul saying here? Act the same way, whether you're in the presence of me as your pastor, or 
Whether you're in my presence or whether you're not in my presence. Act the same way. We don't want to be hypocritical. You're to follow the lead of your, your, your shepherds. You're to follow the lead of your pastors. Shepherd and pastor is the same office. Shepherd, pastor, overseer. See, through this letter, in this text, Paul's establishing his presence through the letter. Even though Paul's not able to be there, he is still leading his flock. Right? And Paul loves his people. He's longing for his people. I mean, we see this just with the word, my beloved. He's saying, my beloved Paul loves his people. This is, this is really illustrated just a couple verses back in verse 1 when Paul says, for, or verse, chapter 1 verse 8 when he says, For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affections of Christ Jesus. See, Paul's loving his people. And he's saying that you must follow me. You're not only to be obedient to Christ. That's why he's saying, therefore, in verse 12, Therefore, my beloved, you are always, as you've always obeyed, so now, as you've always obeyed Christ, so now obey your shepherd. Primarily Paul. Which is primary teaching Jesus. This is words. All scriptures is the words of Christ. See, Paul loves his people. And he wants them to follow him, whether he's there or whether he's not there. Act the same way. Strive to follow your shepherd who God has put over you. Strive for sanctification. You see this again in 4.1. I mean, this theme is all through scripture. But well, Paul loves his people in Chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. He uses that word, beloved, twice in that verse. See, Paul loves his people. See, this is something that a lot of, a lot of churchgoers just take for granted. But they think that it's, yeah, you got a pastor. What do you mean I got to follow my pastor? Like, who do you think you are? Think you got authority? Well, yeah. Yeah. Pastors do. This is Paul says right here. So now not only in my presence, but much more in my absence. So if a pastor, if a shepherd... It's called by God to preach and teach His Word, to shepherd His flock, and there's a whole bunch of sheep that say, I know how to do things better. Are you really expecting that you're being obedient to Christ? Or being obedient to Paul's command here? See, we must strive for sanctification by following the shepherds that Christ has put over us. See, think of it like this. Think of a, the, the, the shepherd and the flock. It's why it's a great analogy. It's why God used it. You, you have the shepherd that leads all the sheep, right? So God ordains a certain man to guide the flock. And he gives them eyes to see in such a way that he can look through the danger there. Look through the danger there. He's understanding where God's wanting them to go. And then you have all the sheep that are going, Nah, we don't want to go there. Nah, we don't want to go here. We just want to go where we want to go. We get this time and time again in the church. Oh, I hear you. Of course, you're going to see this in the scripture. You're not Paul and you're not an apostle. What makes you think that you should be leading the church? Well, first off, I'm not an apostle. No other pastors are apostles because apostles aren't there anymore. When the last apostle died, the, the, the apostles are no more. But look in 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2, where Peter says, So I exhort the elders, that's a pastor, amongst you as a fellow elder. So not only is he an apostle, but he's a fellow elder. He's a fellow pastor. 
as a fellow elder and a witness to the suffering of Christ, as well as the partakers of his glory, so that in going to be, that is going to be revealed. What, no, verse 2, what's the next thing he says? Shepherd the flock of God that is amongst you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion or willingness, unwillingness, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Do not be domineering over those in your charge, but be examples of the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfeeling crown, unfading crown of glory. See, Paul told not only the Philippians, that whether you're in my presence or in my absence, to strive for a sanctification. Work the same way. And we, as the church today, we still must strive for sanctification by following the shepherds that God has put over our lives. See, God calls certain men to, to shepherd the flock. And we have an accountability to them, them men. And Hebrews 13 17 says it like this. He says, obey your leaders. This is Paul saying this, the same thing. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls. As those who have to give an account, let them do this with joy, not with groaning, not or for, the, for that would be of no advantage to you. See, I'm going to be held accountable by how I handle God's word. How I preach God's word. How I teach God's word. How I shepherd you. I'm going to be held accountable. I'm going to be judged by that. Do you see what the text says you're going to be judged by? How you obey. How you submit to your leaders. I'm pretty confident that I'm submitting to the word of God. And I'm following the word of God. And that's what I'm going to be judged by. Are you confident that you're Doing this commandment. Because that's what you're going to be judged by. See. We are to strive for sanctification. By striving to follow the shepherds. That God has put over you. That Christ has put over you. That Christ has ordained. And put them in his place. That's why Paul says. So not only in my presence. But much more in my absence. 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 says. Be imitators of me. As I am of Christ. Paul says just a couple verses over. In chapter 3 verse 17. He says brothers join in imitating me. And here's the key verse. Or key part of the verse. And keep your eyes on those who walk. According to the examples. You have in us. See we are to strive. For our sanctification. By striving to follow the shepherds. That Christ has put in our lives. Follow your leaders. When you need something, reach out to us. If there's some way we can serve you, let us know. We can't, I can't know that if, you, if you're not coming to me. Get a hold of the deacons. They would love to serve you. That's what the, the word deacon means, is a servant of the church. That's why the church is pastor-led, deacon-served, congregational-approved. Reach out to your deacons. They love serving people. That's why they're deacons. God has gifted them in such a way to do so. Reach out to me as your pastor. How can I serve you? See, our goal isn't to, to do it with grumbling. Our goal isn't to do it to, to show our authority. Our goal is to be humble. We have the same have to be obedient and be humble as Christ was too, right? That's what Paul says. To be imitators of me as I am Christ. That's the same thing I say to you, church. And that's how one of the qualifications for a pastor. If a pastor can't say to you, be imitators of me as I am of Christ, then they're not qualified. They need to sit down and shut up. That doesn't mean with duct tape either. I do have the duct tape. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we must strive for sanctification. Oh, I hear some of you. 
Some of you might be thinking, you just want to show your authority. And then you put a little joke at the end of it. I hear you. You just want to take a position of authority. And you want to use the Bible to push off your authority. No. No. I want you to see that we must strive for sanctification. And when God is working in you and working in me, that's when we're, we need to work that out and strive for that. So we must strive for sanctification because we revere God. So not only must we strive for sanctification by striving to follow the shepherds that Christ has put in our lives, but we must strive for sanctification because we revere God. Look with me again at verse 12. The very end of verse 12. Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. See, we hear this word fear and trembling and in coordination with God. And we have all, automatically this idea that he is a sovereign king that, and a sovereign God. That if you're disobedient to him, he's got all power and all wrath. And I don't shy back from preaching sermons on wrath. You guys know that. It's part of the Bible. I'm bound to preaching what's in the word of God. Not my own philosophical ideologies. But the scriptures say, I have to preach. Or I will be held accountable. Even if you don't like it. That's between you and God. You can not like what he says. And I don't kill the messenger. I just got to say what he says. But that word fear and trembling, it doesn't always mean to, to shake in your shoes because you're feared that God's going to crush you. Sure, there are passages in the Bible that did speak about that. But this here is more of an, an idiom for an attitude towards, for our obedience to Christ. It's, or you could say, it, as, as it says in Ephesians 5.21, submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. See, the fear and trembling, it, it works as that idiom meaning towards the, towards the reverence of Christ. It's talking about being concerned of the possibility of failure. God has given us, Christ has given us a, a, a rules and a regulation of, to, to be obedient. He's given us commands to do. And we fear that we may not be able to do them. See, out of fear and trembling, it, it recognizes our weakness in the power of temptation. Paul might come up to us and say, if we were a part of the church of Philippi, and I'm sure when you make it to heaven, you ask him this, he'll confirm because this is his word that I'm saying. That he might come up to us and say, well, you know, Christ has given us some pretty hard tasks to do. To go and make disciples of all nations. Man, you could get beaten, shipwrecked, stoned. Paul had that all happen to him. And we might fear that how are we ever going to get the gospel message out? How are we ever going to get through these things in our lives? Or maybe it's something not physical, but maybe it's something spiritual within ourselves. Paul might say to you that, yeah, it's going to be difficult to deal with your anxiety. Yeah, it's going to be difficult to deal with these situations by losing your job. But you know what? God's will be done. He'll, he'll get you through this. It's going to be hard, but in your weakness, God works through you. You will get through this because it's God that works in you. And we, all you've got to do is strive for sanctification. And He will bring it to completion. So when you think of fear and trembling, don't think of it so much as, I'm fearing the wrath of God is going to come down upon me. Now, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you should fear that. You should absolutely fear that. Because He is a holy God. And there's no, no room for sin. Sin has to have punishment. And it will be punished. The wage of sin is death. But the good news is that Jesus Christ paid that way. See, this word fear and trembling, this phrase, this idiom, really means reverence and awe. Again, it, you can look at it like your reverence or your devotion to God. It's not so much as fearing it. See, we must strive for sanctification because we revere God. Think about 
with a practical way of thinking. How do we revere God? Well, how do we revere somebody else? We were talking about speeding tickets down in Sunday school. So, you get a speeding ticket because you go too slow or maybe too fast. What do you do? You go in front of the judge. So what do you, you want to wear your best Sunday suit? Get in front of the judge? Because you want him to see how you are? You, you want to show him that you, you honor him? You have respect for him? You, you revere the courtroom? Well, unless you're a criminal, most, a lot of criminals don't do that. Or they want to portray something they're not. Right? But when you come into the, the presence of the judge, there's a little bit of a rumbling in your gut, right? You're not so sure how this, oh, this little, he can give me a $200 fine, you know? So we want to be our best dressed, our best behavior. You revere the judge. Well, for those of you that were in the military, you revere your sergeant or your commanding officer. Now, that might be a little more fear there because you don't want to be demoted or cleaning out the latrine. See, we revere God. So we, we strive for sanctification because we revere God. Hebrews, again in the book of Hebrews 12, 28, says it like this. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. See, because we know that we've been transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of the beloved son, that we, 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 we've received this kingdom, and this kingdom can't be shaken, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. See, that's what Paul was seeing, saying here. We strive for sanctification because we revere God. Are you striving to honor Christ as your Lord, as holy? As it says in 1 Peter 3.15, But in your heart, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being ready to give a defense for the hope that is in you. Are you striving to sanctify Christ in your heart? When we gather together as God's collective people, do you strive to sanctify your heart? Are you striving to honor Christ, to revere Him through the worship? Are you striving to create an environment that reveres Christ not only for yourself, but for the rest of the brethren? Or are you continuously to grumble? Are you grumbling? Are you, or are you striving to have a pure heart? We must Set Christ aside. Set God aside as holy. See, we must strive for sanctification. Because we revere God. Strive for sanctification, brothers and sisters. Do you not know that when God's people gather as the church, our covenant God is amongst us? See, we must strive for sanctification because we're striving to stand, or we're standing in the presence of God. We must strive for this sanctification because we are standing in the presence of God. Look again at the second part of verse 12 and the first part of verse 13. He says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God that works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. See, this is the whole reason why you can be obedient to Christ. This is the whole reason why you can follow your shepherds. This is the whole reason why you can revere God. Because it is Him that's working in you. You are in the presence of God. Do you guys focus on that often? Do you think about that often? That you're in the presence of a holy God. This should give you so much encouragement. And it should give you so much comfort. Regardless of the anxiety that's going on. Regardless of what's going on throughout the culture. Because our world is flipped upside down with these satanic thought processes. That some people should be elevated above others. 
that could give you comfort. Oh, our world's going to come to an end. America's done. Here we are about to go through the 4th of July and America's done because we got Marxism coming. Oh, this should give you comfort. God is amongst you. Don't let your anxieties beat you down. Am I not going to have any money for food? A job? Something going to happen to one of my kids, my family, my husband, my wife, my daughter, my sons? God is with you. And if you really believe that, you would be comforted. And this is what Paul is saying. This gives us the whole reason for his encouragement. Let this encouragement be there for you. It, see, it's not only an encouragement for our works, what, what we're to do for the, for the kingdom of God, but it should be encouragement for just our own devotion to God. You are standing in His presence. Think about Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. You guys know that story when Isaiah went into the throne room of God? Put yourself there. Just imagine that. That as Isaiah says to you, Tom, come with me. I, got, I want to show you something. And he takes you in, and lo and behold, you're in the presence of God. What did Isaiah say? He fell on his face and said, Woe is me, a man of unclean lips amongst the people of unclean lips. He was in the very presence of God. He was terrified because he knew he was unholy. But see, God is in your presence. He has made you holy. He is working in you so that you can work out what He's working in you. We are to strive for sanctification because we are in God's presence. When you come to church, expect to hear from God. Expect to be in His presence. If you did this every Lord's Day, if you thought this way, you would never miss church. Never. You would revolve your life around the household of God rather than the household of God revolved around your life. See, and when you do that, I know. I'm not, I don't need some special spiritual eyes. I know you don't think that you're in the presence of God. You're just coming to the club. You come to the building. You don't expect to be in the presence of God. See, if you did, you would cherish every second of the worship service. You would not be grumbling about how long the sermons were. You would not be grumbling about how many songs we sang. How long the prayers were. You would feel that you were in the presence of God. And that's all that would matter to you. For many of you. You say. I didn't get anything out of the service. I didn't get anything out of this pastor's service. This pastor's boring. I can't get anything out of the service. Do you really think it's entirely the pastor's fault? Of course, sometimes it is. Sometimes it's not entirely. Sometimes it is the pastor's fault. He's boring or he rambles on or the church wants to put duct tape on his mouth because he does, doesn't shut up. But Maybe he just reads his sermons and he's got this long, boring, monotone voice and it puts you to sleep. But do you still think that's his fault? What if God... What if God Almighty, what if Christ Jesus, when we are physically in His presence, talks with a very monotone voice? He doesn't change His voice ever. Are you going to say, I'm not getting anything out of this talk from Jesus? No! You're not going to do that. Why do you do it here? Because you don't think you're in the presence of God. You think you're coming to the club. See, it's your attitude towards being in the presence of God that causes you to have such a hardened heart. See, we must strive for sanctification, brothers and sisters. This is, this is normal. This, this is normal part of the sin nature, the sinful heart. But we must strive for this sanctification. Because we're standing in the presence of God. 
See, if you believed that you were in the presence of God, you would not strive, you would strive to bring God pleasure. You wouldn't stop working to bring God pleasure. If you believed that you were in God's presence, would you not? Would you not strive? Of course you would. See, we must strive for sanctification because we are standing united for God's pleasure. Look at the last part of verse 13. He says, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. See, the whole purpose of man being created is to bring God glory. That, that is the whole thing that we are purposed for. is to bring the glory of God, to make God glorified. And we are to be united with this. Look when Paul says in verse 12, he says, My beloved. See, we have this idea that Paul is speaking to you. you that you're his beloved. Or if God is speaking to you, you're his beloved. But brothers and sisters, this is plural. He's not speaking to you individually, and you individually, and you individually. He's speaking to all y'all. See, the word you, we use, that's why we have y'all or yins. But in the Greek, the original languages, it's pretty clear when it's a plural. See, we are striving for sanctification because we are to strive, or stand united for God's pleasure. God has created us, and He's for us to be in His presence, to glorify Him. For I mean, there's nothing above God. But we have this individualistic ideology that it's all about me, 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 me. Did you not know that you are the temple of God? That you isn't you individually and you individually. It's you corporately. See, if we're to strive for sanctification, it's not just you individually. If you as a church are not striving to be sanctified then you individually probably aren't either. See, even though the church in a whole, and what Paul is actually speaking about here, is the church in a whole, there are individuals. So yes, this is referring to individuals, but it's also referring corporately. See, many of us are stuck in this culture of me. We think it's all about ourselves. I this and I that. It's all about me and my feelings and my opinions. What can I get out of this situation? See, that's not striving for sanctification. That's not striving for unity. We must strive for sanctification because we're standing united for God's pleasure. It's not about you. It's, not, it's about, every, about God and doing His will. Sanctification is not about individualism. See, sanctification is, is a matter of, it's not about individualism, but, but we as the local church are to be striving together as one entity for sanctification. We have this happening not just here, but everywhere. I mean, we haven't had a business meeting in over a year. Why? Because you need... 13 individuals to do the business of the church. That's a shame. You have such an idea that it's all about each individual person. No, it's about the whole. You yourself don't have any individual authority as the church. You as a whole do. You are to strive united together. But if your individualism gets in the way of the whole, maybe that one individual person is so focused on their individualism, individualism, I must try to create some weird new word. Maybe that one individualistic person isn't of the church, but they're just a member of the club. See, brothers and sisters, if there isn't ministry going on in this church, that means we're not striving for sanctification because we're not standing united for God's pleasure. And therefore, you're not pleasing God. 
You're being a nominal Christian by name only. It don't matter how old you are, how young you are, how energetic you are, how your back hurts, how your feelings hurt. It don't matter. Strive for your sanctification. If there isn't any ministry going on, God may have departed from this place. See, scriptures tell us that you are the temple of God. And if God is in your presence, he will be working because he is a restless sovereign God. So what have we learned? We've learned that we must strive for sanctification by working out what God is working in us. We must strive for sanctification by striving to obey Christ. And we must strive for sanctification by striving to follow the shepherds that Christ has put over you. Then we see that we must strive for sanctification because we revere God. And we must strive for sanctification because we are standing in the presence of God. Finally, we've seen that we must strive for sanctification because we are standing united for God's pleasure. Brothers and sisters, do just that. Strive for your sanctification. Let us pray.